All right, I'm going to read this uh, chapter of the Bible and we'll talk about it. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the gold vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them, and they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. And in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed. That's a polite way of saying he lost countenance. Seriously. He's so terrified. And his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever will read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof will be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and will be the third ruler in the kingdom. He's terrified. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they couldn't read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. One of the most famous stories in the whole Bible. But how many of you realize the context? See, we just read about a king that went mad because he thought he was God, and that's the end of thinking you're God. You're going to go mad. This generation's going mad because they think they're God. They're godless, and they actually think they're God. They're going crazy. But God took his mind away from him, then gave it back. And that king had quite a long reign. He was a king of Babylon, but he became a believer in the only true God. And he reigned for a long time. But this story comes almost 50 or 60 years later. This is that king's grandson, Belshazzar. And this story takes place in the context of a siege of Babylon. Babylon was like the undisputed ruler of the world, the head of gold, the most powerful kingdom that ever had existed up until that time. And at the time of this story, there's a siege around it. The Persians, uh, which we call Iranians, had circled the, the city. And one of the truly great men of history, it's a Shame, most people don't know that much about him. He's one of the greatest men in history. Cyrus, the Persian, had the city of Babylon besieged. And they did, obviously, they weren't worried about it. That's the point of this story. They weren't worried at all about it. After all, Babylon had a wall that was 87 foot high, 15 miles around, it's 22 feet thick. 15-mile wall. It straddled the Euphrates River. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't deprive it of water. The river went right through the middle of it. And a deep moat also was around the city, 30 feet deep. 250 watchtowers that set places around the wall. 150 enormous brass gates just set like sentinels around that city. And the entrance to the river, because I told you this river goes right through the city, the entrance to the river had a very intricate brass leaved gate, is what they called it. You, it was impregnable. You couldn't do it. But like I said, Cyrus is one of those unique people in history. I'll tell you about the, uh, let me talk about the uniqueness of Cyrus for a minute here, okay? Ancient history lesson. But look, we've got to know our history to know our future, all right? Because what history is future. What happened at the beginning is going to happen at the end. This story really isn't about, oh, wow, a dusty old history lesson. This story is about you and me today. This story is about America. This story is about Europe. This story is about the world, okay? So follow me. Let's talk about this great king named Cyrus for a minute. Cyrus is unique 
because God himself calls him a Christ. He's an anointed one. God calls him my shepherd. God calls him my servant. Even though this man didn't know God at all. He's pagan. Okay. But he's going to do God's will. So God can use a pagan ruler. God called him my Christ, my shepherd, my servant, who will do all my will. Okay. Cyrus is the one that took Babylon. And when he actually marched into Babylon three days after the city fell, Jewish priests showed him a copy of the book of Isaiah, which was about 150 years old. And in that book was a letter to Cyrus by name from God, telling him what he's going to do. Hold your finger in Daniel 5. Look at this. Now, this is not just history either. We want people to believe the Bible. We insist that people believe the Bible. We call on people to believe the Bible. We demand that they believe the Bible. But why should they believe the Bible? They're supposed to check their brains in at the door? You don't have to. God has credentials, and the credentials are prophecies that were fulfilled, that were spoken hundreds of years previously. And this is a great example of one of them. This is recorded not only in biblical history, but secular history, the story of Cyrus the Great. And look what God says in Isaiah 44, verse 27. God uh, thus said, oh, yeah, let's see. Verse 27 is where we'll start. He's talking about what God will do, that God will say to the deep, be dry, and will dry up the rivers. And that saith of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and will perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, you will be built into the temple, your foundation will be laid. When Cyrus became king, he took over Babylon, he was the king of the world, one of the first acts he did is he said, I want the Jews to go home, and I want to finance the building of their temple, and I'm going to make sure this thing happens. Why would a pagan king send the Jews home and finance the building of their temple? Because God ordained that he would. Before he was even born, God had a letter to him in the book of Isaiah 150 years earlier. And when the Jewish priest showed Cyrus this, he was astonished. You would be too. Look at verse 1 of chapter 45. Unfortunate chapter break here. Shouldn't have broke. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open... Bef- loose the loins of kings. That prophecy was fulfilled in Daniel 5. The king lost his loins. To open before him the two-leaved gates. They didn't even exist when Isaiah saw this vision. You can open the two-leaf gate. Now, you can see how this actually happened in history. And the gates shall not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I'll break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. Those gates of brass didn't exist yet. 150 brass gates. I'll give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, I'm the God of Israel. So the way history goes, Cyrus is clever. He sees these 87 foot walls, 22 feet across, 15 miles of wall, absolutely impregnable. He sees the greatest world power ever, 250 high towers, and a river raging through the city. You're not going to deny them anything. And two uh, intricately woven leave gates at the entrance of the river. So you just can't do this. And that, those leave gates were not on the outside of the city. The river ran under the wall. They were on the inner wall. So even if you got through the outer wall, you still had to get through the leave gates to get in the city. So what he does, he sets up siege, and the first thing he does is he personally challenges the king of Babylon to come out and fight him like a man. And Isaiah also predicted the men of Babylon have become like women. They, they, they hold themselves up in their city, and they won't come out. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar would have, but not, not this one. He's decadent. Okay. Now, one lesson you can think of there. Think of our earliest leaders and how manly they were. And think of the ones we have today. When God judges a nation, the book of Isaiah 3 says, He sets children and women over them. 
This king wouldn't budge, but he didn't feel he had to. When you got 87 feet walls, 22 feet across, 150 brass gates, leaving gates, a, a river running through the city, and 250 guard towers of the greatest world empire I've ever seen, you don't think you have to go out there. So he doesn't. So then Cyrus takes a look at the city. He's one of the great, great men of the world and, and one of the cleverest world leaders ever. Now nah, we can't do that. We can't break down those walls. We can't get through. We can't overpower. No. So we're going to do this by cleverness. Basically what he does is he keeps a stationary army around the city and takes a bulk of his troops back out of sight up the Euphrates River and they dig a channel to lower the level of the Euphrates River. No one notices. They divert it into an empty, swampy lake bed. So as the Babylonians are thinking, we are as secure as you could ever be. No one's going to breach those walls or anything like that. Cyrus the Great is digging a diversionary channel of the Euphrates River. In other words, he's drying up the Euphrates River. But does that not happen again? Is that not what the book of Revelation says is going to happen? He withdraws his... He, at, when he's finally ready... The river's so low, you could actually walk across it, but no Babylonian notices. They don't think they have to. They think they're secure. Their technology, their military might, their city, their walls, their towers, their reputation, they think they're secure. They're oblivious to what is right around the corner. Look around you at this evil generation, which imagines it's utterly secure, not realizing the barbarians are already assembling at the gates. He finally gets the river down to a passable level. They don't know that. What are they doing? On the last night of Babylon, it's Babylon's last supper. What are they doing? Crying? Praying? No, it's party time. They're plastered because they feel so good, especially when he withdraws his army out of their sight. They think, well, they're gone. They left. And he throws a huge feast. For his people. He withdraws the troops. And then they feel secure. And then when night falls. His troops go right into the Euphrates River. And they get past the outer wall. It's 87 feet high. And 22 feet thick. And they think now what are we going to do about those. Intricately woven very heavy brass leaved gates. And you know what. Lo and behold. They were shocked when they got in to see those gates to that river were wide open. What did God tell King Cyrus 150 years before the man was even born? I am the one who's taking you by the hand and giving you these victories and I will open the leaved gates. They're stunned. They come into the city. This party is so wild. It took three days before anyone realized they'd even been invaded. They take over. Remember, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar had a vision that there'd be a head of gold and then the shoulders of silver, and that'd be the Persian Empire, Iran. By the way, Persia, they're in the news every day, Iran. Babylon's in the news all the time, Iraq. Babylon's uh, still going to be in the news. Babylon, uh, Iraq war is not over. A civil war is about ready to break out there. It'll be so vicious it'll make Syria look tame at this point. These people are savages. But we're decadent. Therefore, we're blind. And the reason for the decadence and the blindness is confidence. That's the meaning of this story. So while one of the truly brilliant men of history is using cleverness, but also being guided by God himself into the greatest stronghold the world had ever seen. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson is throwing a huge, drunken, immoral, sinful party. Once again, look around you. Jesus is just about ready to come. Ancient prophecies are being fulfilled. We're so sure of our technology and our military prowess. 
We don't realize the gates are open and the people at the top are oblivious to really what's going on. They're absolutely oblivious to what's about ready to break forth. It's exactly what Paul the Apostle said. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them and they shall not escape for it shall come as a, a labor upon a woman with child. And that's exactly what happened in this story. But take a look, a closer look at this night of revelry. See, because Babylon has a spiritual meaning, as I said in the first chapter of Daniel. Babylon is a city. Babylon is a region. We had a headquarters over there in the Iraq War. Babalu uh, division. Babylon is a region. Babylon is a city. But Babylon is much more than that. Babylon is a type of man in his proud independence and defiance of the only true God. So when the Bible says at the end, Babylon the Great is fallen, it's fallen, Babylon is fallen. I'm not just talking about Iraq. I'm talking about the West. I'm talking about the modern world. Talking about the technological paradise that we've made for ourselves. Talking about the ones who throttled morality and marriage, who promote homosexuality and, and, and abortion, who love death so much. That's the Babylon that's on the verge, like a ripe fruit, ready to be plucked right off the branch. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And God likens Babylon to a harlot because... There's a prostitute element. Everything's for sale. I think this thing with the secret service men, that's not just a news story. That's a message from God about what's going on. That's a message from God about what's happening. How the faithful city has become a harlot. And <laughs> so much more. Babylon is a false religious system. And false religion is coming to its apogee. Babylon is a false economic system. Because when the John the Apostle saw a vision of Babylon in Revelation, one of the visions he saw almost looked like one of our shopping malls. Or maybe like eBay or the Internet or something. You can buy everything there. You can get anything you want. You can pay. Uh, if you've got the money, then you can have anything. No consideration of morality. No fear of God. No, fear, uh, no consideration of anything. All is for sale at Mystery Babylon. It's like a huge shopping mart. And the last thing you can get, and probably of the cheapest value, is the souls of men. I wonder how many young kids people have been totally corrupted by the pornography that predominates the inter internet. I wonder how full hell shall be because this generation ridiculed and mocked God and everything sacred and holy. How full, how empty hell is, how unsatisfied it is. More and more must pour in there as this evil generation actually ridicules what they once knew. And on the eve of the destruction of Babylon, where do we find them? Are they supplicating God? Are they praying? Are they soul searching? Are they humbling themselves? Their false confidence leads them into the biggest drunken party that you've ever seen. It went on so long that it took three days before they discovered that they'd just been taken over. But the party is focused on. The night of revelry is looked at closely. And so you see in Daniel chapter 5 that there comes a tipping point for Babylon, a point of no return. I wonder how close we are to it. An obscene idea comes into the mind of Belshazzar because, first of all, you've got to understand the mindset of Babylon. We defeated the God of the Jews. He's nothing. That's a non-issue. That's the mindset of our leadership. Christianity is a non-issue. You can't believe how far they are from normal people in this country, from the normal heartland people. I'm not saying the normal people are all right. This country is really backslidden, okay? But you can't believe how, how much of a settled question it is that there's nothing to religion, nothing to Christ, nothing to God, to our leaders and elite. It's just like we defeated that. That's over. That's a done deal. We're making a new world without it. Well, that's the way Babylon was with, with the God of 
the Bible, the only true God. They defeated him and destroyed his temple and took their people into captivity. And that was that. It's done. By the rivers of Babylon, there we lay down our harps and wept whenever we remember Zion. They, they took it out. So he has an obscene idea at the height of the party. Hey, go get the vessels from the temple of God in Jerusalem and bring them out so that we can really, we can drink out of them. Basically, it's not a mistake. It's a real statement. It's, I'm not intimidated by him. And he doesn't have any power. And I'm going to demonstrate that by profaning these sacred vessels. What is the temple? The temple. The temple was the teaching, the only real teaching in the whole world other than the Torah itself, of who Jesus would be. The temple was the representation of who Jesus would be and what he would do. It's a living object lesson. It's the greatest object lesson ever given. It's the greatest teaching example ever given. It's the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And these Babylonians who plundered that temple under God's power, at God's command, they got so high on their self-confidence, so full of ego, so full of pride at their accomplishments, that this obscene idea comes to the king, go get the vessel! The holy sacred vessels that we plundered from that defeated God. Bring them in because we're going to party, man. And so their drunken orgy now involves sacred objects. That's the problem with Babylon. And that's the problem with our modern Babylon. That there's no sense of sacred or holy. Doesn't the Bible say a very important insight in the book of Proverbs? Don't miss this by its familiarity. The book of Proverbs uh, chapter 9 says, By the knowledge of the holy comes understanding. No, it doesn't say by the knowledge of the holy one. He's just talking about the concept of holy. What's the concept of holy? The concept of holy is, look, there's someone above me. Man's not everything. There are some things that you dare not profane. And God has allowed certain things in this world as projections of holy. God himself is holy. Holy means other. Holy doesn't just mean pure. Holy doesn't just mean sinless. That's a negative word. Holy means other, separate. And God has instituted certain things in the world of man, to give us some idea, some concept of holy, some understanding. Sex is holy. Sex is holy. It's other. It's not common. Marriage is holy. It wasn't ordained by man. Anybody here? Who's the author of marriage? God is. From the beginning of time, for this cause, Adam prophesied, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Marriage is holy. What's holy mean then? Holy is the opposite of holy is profane, which just means common. Why do people use profane language? Why does everyone just fill their mouth from Hollywood and from rap? And you look at the, the pro uh, athletes for the most part and, and even the politicians, even our vice president. Why do they fill their mouth with profane things? Why do they speak profanely or make something holy like sex common? Or something like marriage? Or the name of God is holy? So what's the meaning of the third commandment? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What's the meaning of that? The meaning is that you should regard God as holy, other. But what is the meaning of profanity? Little, tiny, pathetic losers. Uncomfortable with anyone or anything above the self. Therefore, they must reach up 
and pull down that which is holy. And they have to wipe their shoes on it. Do you understand? They have to. So that there can be nothing in their imagination or soul that's above them. This is the meaning of profane. This is the meaning of vile language. This is the meaning of taking God's name in vain. Here's the nightmare that even some Christian young people, because it's become such a profane generation, will use F words and A nightmare. It's frightening. Not frightening that they say that. It's frightening what saying that actually teaches us about ourselves. That if holy is other, do we not want to be holy? Do we want not want to be with God? Do we not want to be other than the profane, which is normal, nothing? And sex itself is treated as profane. It's no different than eating a sandwich or watching a concert or eating a pizza. Just another common experience. Hooking up. Do you not see the clouds gathering on the horizon? Do you not hear the thunder rumbling? The thunder of Sinai? Do you not know that a holy and righteous God of wrath is already mounting up punishment for this evil generation. Do you know how bad a trouble we're in? Well, they didn't. And they were led, beloved. It's almost like they had to. It was the last thing within reach. The last thing left. The holy vessels and get them out. (laughs) Ask this evil generation if there's anything left for them to profane. Why would there have to be a homosexual uh, marriage law? Homosexuals are not monogamous. They're notoriously bestial. Why would there have to be one? Well, I have a theory about that. It's because marriage is holy. So they must profane it. They have to mar it. Even if they end up getting married and divorced 30 times, it was worth it. It was worth it. Are you here? The barbarians of the Muslim world, our president in Europe, pulled the rug underneath a lot of really nasty people like Mubarak in Egypt. So they could forward this Arab Spring. And before the revolution was complete, Coptic Christians were being slaughtered in the streets of Cairo. Christian girls were kidnapped and forcibly converted to Islam. And what passes for a parliament in Egypt is actually voting on a law that allows necrophilia. Evil, we're looking evil in the face. I'm not trying to be gratuitous. I think wisdom's crying out saying, look at what is going on. It's so frightening. But they didn't know it. They were drunk and they started drinking. Look at verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, and of brass, and of iron, and of wood, and of stone. And they profane the vessels of God's holy temple to do it. But hey, to them, it's just a defeated thing, you know. But then the king is terrified, because the way it describes it, it's just like out of the wall projects a hand and starts writing. It's frightening. His countenances change. His thoughts trouble him. People don't like the uh, troubling thoughts that break through every now and then. So in this evil generation turns up the music. And they get ever more into the entertainments. Because they don't want to think. 
the joints of his loins were loose, though. That had to be embarrassing. And his knees smote one against another. Then he cries out to the same old tired experts. And that's one of the themes of the book of Daniel. These guys, they get trotted out every time. And before they had the Jewish captives, these guys were the experts. But they're looking stupider each time. They can't help him. So he sees this hand writing on the wall. Now, you've got to understand that it's not so much that it was totally cryptic. They knew what the words were. Many, many tekel uparsin. Now, let me explain something about this. Those were words that they understood. They knew what that was. Okay, what's many? Many tekel uparsin. Well, one thing it is, is the name of the coins of the realm. Mene means numbers, and we get our word money from it. Did you know that? Tekel means weight, and you get the, it became shekel, the shekel, okay, the half shekel, the shekel. The parson is a half penny, and literally it was a coin that was shaped like a half moon. It's a split penny because parson means split, but also this is a pun. Parson also means Persian. Okay, split. So they knew what the words were. It would be about like if you saw a hand all of a sudden writing, nickel, nickel, quarter, dime. Okay, I know what that is, but what's the interpretation? So also this evil generation. They know what something really bad is coming. The problem is they lack an interpretation and they trot the experts out, and the experts have no real answers. The experts don't even tell the truth anymore. From the time they started saying, you know what, whatever this is, it's not Islam. Islam's a religion of peace. You know these experts are worthless. Utterly worthless. Liars. And they have a political axe to grind. The experts won't help with these problems. Then the king is perplexed. The party's in danger of being ruined. You don't want that, right? Don't ruin the party. And so he summons the queen mother. This was the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. She's not at the party, to her credit. She was probably a believer. Now listen. She remembers an old asset that the kingdom once had. There's a dusty old guy that we captured from the Jews a long time ago. Bring him out. Maybe he can help. And I'd like, uh, well, if you notice verse 13. Then was Daniel brought before the king, and the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Are you that Daniel which are the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? Do you notice what's in that statement? pride. You one of those captives that we took? And then he says, I heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. The disdain of our leaders, the disdain of our elite, not just political, opinion shapers, media, arts, education, the disdain they have for Christians. You one of those that we defeated a long time ago? One of those Bible being fundamentalists? I hear, though, that you can solve riddles. This is the way some people look at Bible prophecy. There is an interest in Bible prophecy, but be careful of the interest that is no different than the interest in Nicod- uh, what's that guy? Nostradamus or a few of the other. You know, it's just a curio thing, a parlor uh, interest. Something is mildly interesting. A Discovery Channel might have something, hidden secrets or mysteries. No, prophecy makes moral demands. Prophecy comes to pass and then demands, what are you going to do? You've got to get right with God. Hurry up and get right with God because God spoke this a long time ago and now it's come to pass. There's nothing curious about it. It makes a moral demand. And so this guy brings up the old relic from his grandfather's day, the old Jewish captive that we long ago defeated. says, I hear you can solve riddles. And Daniel says, well... I can't, but God God can. But I, before I do anything, Daniel brings in the moral lesson. And the moral lesson is this. This is pretty 
pretty good. It teaches about witnessing that always call men to repentance. He says, King, you know the story about your grandfather. How he thought that he was God until God took his mind away and reduced him to nothing. And then wonder of wonders and miracle of miracles. God put him right back on his throne when he got his right mind back. And you know it. You know it. Verse 17, Daniel answered and said, King, let thy gifts be to yourself. I don't want your gifts. He says, you solve this riddle, I'll make you third in the kingdom. I'll give you a robe. I'll give you uh, rings and jewels. I'll give you position. What good position in a dying empire? last thing you want to be is third in the kingdom. When the Persians come in, I don't know anything here. <laughs> See, that speaks to all the things. As Babylon's sun goes down, all the things people think are important. Position, power, fame, money, esteem, worldly honors. Keep it, Daniel says. Verse 18, O oh, you king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, language trembled and feared before him. Verse 19, whom he would slew and whom he would kept alive and whom he had set up and whom he had put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. He's making the moral point. Your, father, your grandfather was proud. He was lifted up. He was an atheist. He was godless. He thought he was God. But God put him in his place. He was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beasts. His dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that He appoints over it whoever He wants. And you, his son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart. Notice Daniel just doesn't just tell him the riddle. He makes him hear the moral point and drives him. You should, you should have learned from that. Look at verse 22. Though you knew all this. People of our generation are not in trouble for what they don't know. They're in trouble because of what they do know. And our job is usually not to tell them what they don't know. Our job is to drive home what they already know. But they're fighting. He says, But you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they brought the vessels of the house before thee. And you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine in them. And you praise the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron, wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And God, in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, you have not glorified Him. That's the ultimate and primal sin. The primal sin of everybody is the refusal to give God the glory. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Here's our job again. They see the hand writing on the wall. Your job is to know Bible prophecy so you can point it to them. Here's the meaning of that. Stuff that's going on over there in Syria, Syria's in the Bible. Stuff that's going on over there in Iraq, Iraq's in the Bible. It's not called Iraq. Stuff that's going on over there in Israel, Israel is in the Bible. The resurrection of Israel is in the Bible. We're supposed to interpret the handwriting for them. And the interpretation is this. God, many, numbers, numbered, numbered. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Because you only had so many days to have a kingdom and it's over. Paris, or Tekel, you're weighed in the balances and found wanting. Yeah, too light. Too light. Paris, your kingdom's divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
Then commends Belshazzar. Now look at Belshazzar's reaction, because this may be the most instructive thing of all. What's Belshazzar do? Does he fall on his face and say, what should I do to get ready for this awful event? Show me the way to be saved. Is there any hope for me? Is it too late to change? Can I repent? No, no, no. He doesn't think that way. And I'm sorry to say that so many in this evil generation don't think that way either. Change? Admit you're wrong? Yeah, man, it's cool, these prophecies. It's cool, all these predictions. It's cool, all this stuff of the world. All right, give him his medal. Give him his gold. Give him his silver. Put a, put a ring on his finger. Oh, praise Daniel. The last thing they do, though, is admit they're wrong and humble themselves and repent. That's why I have been gripped by such a realization that hell from beneath is absolutely restless to receive more. It shall ever expand. It's terrible. Hell is being heated up. Judgment is coming. But they'll still profane the holy things. They don't have a temple to take vessels from. No, the holy things that they profane are even deeper than the temple. Things ordained from the beginning, like marriage. Sex, the gender roles. Honor thy father and mother. Fear God. Worship him. These are the things that they profane with impunity. These are the things that they keep rushing toward the tipping point, the point of no return. And when, they, when it's explained to them, when witnesses like Daniel give a history lesson or point out an interpretation, we pray that they'll repent. We pray that they'll change their mind. We pray that they'll soul search. But I'm afraid so many are so reprobate. All they can think in terms of is worldliness. So, Daniel, way to go. You are the prophet of the day. You get the medal. You get the honorary Babylonian medal of honor. Person of the year. Put him on the cover of people. While the barbarians are sharpening their swords and knives already in the city. So, verse 30, Babylon goes in the end. It's anticlimactic. It doesn't even describe a, a battle. The thing fell like a rotten plum. That night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldees, slain. That's it. Great king of the world, most esteemed man of all. That night he was put in his grave, sent to hell. What a chance he had. What if he would have said, hey, Daniel, show me, show me. I believe it. He did believe it. He believed Daniel. But his belief wasn't the belief of, of real saving faith. Saving faith is not just belief. It's belief that moves you. It moves you to a change of heart, a change of mind. His belief didn't change his heart. He's still a Babylonian. Put a medal on him. That'll thrill him. Give him a title. Darius. The Mead, this is according to the, prom, uh, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. Persians shall take over from the Babylonians. Darius the Mead took the kingdom, and he was 62 years old. Father, we have more than a history lesson here, Lord. Because we know that with you, history is prophecy. We know that Babylon isn't just Iraq. Babylon is the world we live in. And we know the confidence is so unfounded but so great in technology, economy, and the wise men of our day. It's so misfounded. And we see the spirit of blasphemy and profanation for holy things are being profaned every day and every night. We know we're nearing the tipping point. I just pray that we can interpret the handwriting on the wall for the perplexed. And I pray for humility and a change of heart. And I pray for the gift of repentance. And I pray that people will be saved while there's still time.
In Jesus' name. And everybody said, God bless you.